well, I, I think I shall say, um, as I say at every meeting, good evening, more home. <laughs> it feels like a, a very, very long time. And as you will remember, our last meeting was sex and sin in the 17th century. <laughs> uh, it was Alan, Alan Crosby uh, in, in February last year. And uh, anyway, uh, it, it's been pretty awful not doing all of our normal society activities and uh, other things, I guess, were more important. But it's lovely to be doing this and actually we've got 44 participants in the room so far mm -hmm. uh, so I'm very pleased that there's 44 of us uh, well who didn't have another diary appointment and were able to join and had got zoom and so on so that's good um, if you don't know me I'm Simon Williams uh, chair of the Moore Home um, and I, I just a couple of housekeeping things first I'll chair this meeting uh, Bill and I are co-hosting it uh, I'm going to record the meeting because a number of members have asked, can't make this evening and would like um, a, a YouTube record. So what I will do is um, uh, learn to edit this down into a good YouTube, <laughs> post it up, send it out by email and uh, take it off after a, a certain period of time. Bill's pointed out that some of his uh, pictures have, have a copyright attached. Uh, if you don't want to be videoed, simply suppress the video but uh, there isn't going to be anything I, I i will i will edit just so that mm -hmm. we have bills talk and maybe some questions at the end and mm -hmm. and, and and that that will be it um <clears throat> if there are any points or questions as bill speaks please do use the chat facility at the bottom um in, in fact it's nice that we've had um a couple of bubbles coming up already. Pam Davis pointed out to me there are more than 44 of us because there's more than two people per window, one pe person per window. So, um, quite right. Um, yeah, use the chat facility. I'll just take a little record as Bill's speaking and um, put them to him at the end. Uh, and and a statement of the obvious this is our first um, Zoom More Home talk. And I've got a feeling. It, we're going to be doing more judging just by the number of participants that we've got. Um, so please let me know by reply to the email that we sent out to you. Uh, so it'll go back to Andrew Davis. Uh, just let us know how you found this and if there's anything that we could do to improve it. Um, we've just upgraded to Zoom Pro, so we're kind of getting the hang of uh, holding bigger meetings. And uh, anyway, yeah, really would like feedback. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to introduce Bill. Um, Bill Shannon, he's he's an old friend and, and colleague of mine, and uh, he's a friend of the co-op, and we've had some excellent talks from Bill, uh, including uh, Bill actually did a, a, a memorable map talk one evening where um, everyone just wanted to stay on and on. And uh, Bill's an independent researcher in history. His main research interests uh, are the landscape, agricultural and cartographic history of England in the early modern period, um, particularly for the Northwest. He recently completed a life of the antiquarian Richard Curden, the father of Lancashire history, and that's published by the Cheatham Society. Uh, he's currently involved in a five year multidisciplinary research project coordinated by the Bodleian Library uh, concerning the Gough map of Great Britain of circa 1400. And in March 2017, he was elected a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries. Uh, I've got a feeling that 1715 is a very late period for you, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> you had to come out of your comfort zone for this one. So, uh, <coughs> Bill, I'm going to hand over to you now and uh, and away you go thank you i'm going to try and share my screen now and make sure that this works okay um okay can you see that screen all right um simon yep okay good Right. Um, yeah, uh, 1715 is really current affairs as far as I'm concerned. It's, uh, it, it is at the far end of my, my period. But, um, and I'll explain in a minute well, how, how I came to be involved in it. But 
Uh, first of all, just saying about that title there, the Battle of Preston, the last battle on English soil, that probably should have a question mark associated with it because there are those who say that um, the Battle of Sedgemoor was the last battle because the Preston fight was a, a, a siege, not a battle. And there's others who say there was a, a skirmish up on um, uh, in, in Cumbria in the, in the 1745, to which I say, well, that was a skirmish, not a battle. So uh, I'll stick with it for now. Um, OK, now, in November of 2015, I found myself with a group of other people listening to a proclamation of um, James III as King of England, which was probably treasonous, but it was a it was a, a reenactment of a of an event that had happened just 300 years prior to that in, in, in that very spot in Preston. And I got involved as one of a group of historians who'd been asked to work with the city council, with the, the museum and Lancashire archives on commemorating the Battle of, of uh, Preston, which took place in November. Uh, 1715. And later in the week, uh, there was a, a reenactment on the, 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 on the spot in, in Church Street, which was quite exciting to witness. Now, I'd actually got involved in, in this late period because I'd written a little history of the, the, the parish, uh, uh, the little Catholic church that I go to. That the church itself was built in 1790, but it was on a spot that had first had a chapel around about the 1715 period. So I'd been researching that, the background to that, when I, I, say I was approached to, to get involved in this, this bigger project. And what I'd found was that this, this war, if you like, was the first bureaucratic war. The amount of evidence is just unbelievable compared to earlier periods, and particularly the Forfeited Estates Commission, which was set up just after the, uh, the, the, the rebellion, um, to look at those who were uh, accused of high treason during the rebellion, uh, but to widen it and look at, in, in fact, all, all Catholics uh, in the area. And when I say that this was, uh, that there's a lot of information here, there are 12 and a half thousand sheets of information in a hundred odd books, plus a further 23,000 separate documents in this series in the National Archives. It is an unbelievable resource and it's all about individuals. It's all about the individual men who were involved uh, in, in, the, in the, the, the rebellion itself and on a wider basis, the local people who found themselves caught up in it. And not only is it the first bureaucratic war, it's also the first um, newspaper war because newspapers were starting, they sort of relatively recently been invented. And this one, this is the, uh, sorry, sorry, I've got a big um, cursor here that I, I hope you can, you can see. Um, this newspaper, The Political State of Great Britain, edited by a chap called Abel Boyer, uh, was one of those early newspapers. It was a monthly, you subscribed to it. It was quite expensive, one and six, a copy. But this copy came out in late November of 1715, and it gives an account of the progress councils and a total defeat of the rebels in, in Lancashire with a most uh, accurate plan of the town, barricades, batteries, uh, and attacks at Preston in a large copper plate. So not only was there a, a, a newspaper account of the, of the battle, there was also, it was illustrated with a map. And you also have, again, for the first time, eyewitness accounts written down, uh, books written down, this one by a, a, an Anglican clergyman called Robert Patton, who wrote a history of the rebellion. He got himself involved in it on the, the Jacobite side, um, and he'd turned King's evidence, basically, and in return for being allowed to go free, he had to write a history, have it published, which is probably um, pretty well, you know, the, the truth, um, the whole truth, but uh, you know, etc. But he does tend to put a spin on it that puts him in a good light and the Jacobites generally in a bad light. And then there are also um, published and unpublished uh, documentation, letters between the, the various characters involved. And in particular, these ones, which which show the problem that had arisen between General Carpenter, who was the senior officer, and Major General, uh, that's Lieutenant General Carpenter, Major General Wills, who his junior officer, who got to the battle first. And 
had launched a rash attack, highly blamable, losing so many men to no purpose, according to General Carpenter. And Carpenter says, I was going to put him in arrest. And indeed, Carpenter went on to challenge Wills to a duel. And it was only the Duke of Marlborough who stepped in and stopped this uh, from happening. But so that it, you know, on the government side, it wasn't all sweetness and light. But, but my main interest, as Simon has said in his intro, is to do with map history. And I, I, I wasn't aware of this particular map when I started work on this project. This is a manuscript map in the, in the Royal Collection in Windsor. And it is an eyewitness account of the battle and the dip, disposition of the government troops. Um, that map is the basis for the map that Abel Boyer referred to, uh, he included in his, in, in his newspaper. Um, and if you go backwards and forwards, if you just have a look at this area here, look at that sort of triangle there, oops. And you can see it, it obviously is very much based upon that manuscript map. So this map was published in that newspaper by Abel Boyer. It's um, dedicated to the immortal fame of General Wills. Uh, and it shows a cartouche here illustrating the, the attack. Um, and it pretty well shows it as being uh, the bad guys are all Scotsmen, as you can see in their tartans, etc. And you can see um, Saltires lying, lying around and so on. Now, uh, that went on to be published not only in the newspaper, but was also sold as a separate free, uh, separate uh, broadsheet with an account of the battle and lists of all the, the prisoners who'd been taken uh, uh, and so on. And this version of the battle must have upset General Carpenter, because within about three weeks, he had authorized the issue of a separate map of, uh, uh, of the battle, which shows really his, um, it, it tends to show the position about a day later when he had arrived and had sort of taken control. And, and this was published again. And if you have a look here, this particular version is in French. Uh, so it was a, an international publication and it, it is very much the version according to General Carpenter. And there's a very fine copy of this in the Lancashire Archives, a hand-coloured copy, and I'll be using this to talk us through the battle itself. It says it was drawn on the spot by P.M. Esquire. Now, P.M. Esquire seems to have been a, a French Huguenot, a Protestant in the service of the Hanoverians, a fellow called Philippe Mercier, um, and he must have been with the the government army and produced this and sent it down to the king as a sort of immediate report on how the the battle had proceeded and up there in the there's another cartouche a little bit less elaborate than general wills and it shows this this character beating the what sits out of that character I, I think this is supposed to be hercules but i like to think of this actually this is general carpenter and this is general wills um, as seen by uh, general carpenter now it needs saying that this battle of Preston is not the other battle of Preston that was fought in 1648, the one that really brought the first civil war to an end. Here's um, Cromwell at the head of the parliamentary troops riding down to Walton Bridge to cut off the line of the Scots royalist troops who were heading south and heavily defeated them. Um, and as I say, led ultimately to the execution of, of Charles I. Now, we then have the Interregnum, the Commonwealth, etc., And then in 1660, Charles II comes to the throne. I'm emphasizing the fact that he's a Protestant as opposed to some of the others who I'll be talking about as Catholic, because that is very much what this fight is about. Charles died in 60, 1685 without any legitimate children. And he was succeeded by his brother, who was an, a, a, an overt Catholic. Now. He had two daughters by a previous marriage. They'd both been brought up as Protestants. They were pretty well estranged from him, Mary and Anne. And I think the, the idea was pre pretty well people thought, well, you know, he's getting on. OK, so we've got a Catholic on the throne for a few years, but he, he'll die and then he'll be succeeded by one or both or other of his two daughters. But he had married a second wife, a, a Catholic lady, Mary of Medina. And she'd had a number of stillborn or uh, children who died in infancy. But not long after he'd come to the throne, a son was born to James II, thus providing a Catholic heir to the English and Scottish crowns. And that was 
too much. I mean, first of all, there were a lot of rumours that the baby hadn't been born to Mary. It had been smuggled into a, a into a child bed in a, a in a, a warming pan. But anyway, one way or another, James was overthrown, and in his place was in his his daughter Mary was made queen, and her husband William William uh, of Orange, who became William the Third, uh, was invited in to become king, and James went off into exile. Now, about five years ago, I was at a conference in, 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 in Paris and had an afternoon off and I was walking along the South Bank area and came upon this building, which was described as the, the College of the Scots. And there's a sign on the side which says that in this uh, place was a bronze urn, which contained the heart of James II who died at Saint-Germain-en-Laye in 1701. So the heart no longer exists, uh, but that was where it was. But two years ago, I was lucky enough to go to Saint-Germain-en-Laye. It's about 20 miles west of Paris, a superb chateau, which had been lived in by Louis XIV until Versailles was completed. And he gave this chateau to James II in exile. Uh, and James lived out his exile in this superb place. In the town, across from the entranceway leading towards the chateau, is this fantastic classical church. There's me standing on the steps uh, to show the sort of dramatic scale of this church. And on the wall, it says in this church is the shrine to the memory of James II, the last Stuart King of England, who died in exile at the castle of saint germain en laye 1701. This monument was erected by Her Majesty Queen Victoria. And another plaque alongside it says, here lies James the seventh of Scotland, second of England, loyal partner in the Franco-Scottish Old Alliance. And inside the church, there is this magnificent monument shrine, if you like, which is dedicated to Jacobus Secundus, uh, uh, King of England. And it, that word Jacobus is the Latin for James. And it's that word that leads us to call his followers and those of his son, Jacobites. So there's James living in exile and dying in exile in 1701. Now, meanwhile, Mary had died without children. William continued to reign until his, he died in 1702 when he was succeeded by Mary's younger sister, Anne, who um, she had, I think something like 10 children, all of them died either in infancy or, uh, or, or were still born. But under her, the two crowns became unified into the creation of the United Kingdom. She was no longer Queen of England and Queen of Scotland. She was now Queen of the United Kingdom. She died in 1714. She had no children surviving. And that left something of a quandary because quite clearly the, the legitimate heir to the crown was young James, the, the baby who'd been born in 1688. He, he was brought up a Catholic, so he was disbarred from inheriting, but he declared himself James III, and he'd been recognized as King of England by France, by Spain, and by the Papal States. And as I said, his supporters were called Jacobites. Now, I don't expect you to read your way down this, but the point about this is this was the succession to the throne in August 1714. Top of the list is James III and eighth King of England, France, uh, uh, England, Scotland. It says France and Ireland there. Next in line is Anne Marie, Queen of Sardinia, and so on. You work your way right, but she was a Catholic, and then he was a Catholic. He was a Catholic. Etc. You work all your way down until you, you come into number 56, who was George the Elector of Hanover. He was the first Protestant that you came to in that list. And so he got the crown offered to him. So that's the situation that we're at in, in 1714. George, Elector of Hanover, doesn't speak any English. He's supported by the Whigs, which is the um, sort of merchant class type, low church Anglicans, Presbyterians, nonconformists, those for whom anybody but a Catholic was fine. On the other side, supporting James, Prince of Wales, calling himself James III, he was supported by the Tories, the landed gentry, by high church Anglicans for whom um, divine right, for whom the bloodline succession were far more important than his personal beliefs. 
he was supported by the Scots because he was a Stuart and he was supported by the Catholics for fairly obvious reasons. So that's the position that we have in 1715. Now, um, this is a cut down version of a somewhat longer talk, but um, so I won't go into the evidence for this, but there were probably something like 16 or 17,000 Catholics in Lancashire, about one in 10 of the population. But about a third of the land of the county was held by Catholic gentry. And they were obviously very important, them and their, their retainers. And a number of local gentry, the Molyneux, Stanleys, Gerrards, Dickinsons, all the sort of famous names, had been implicated in the Lancashire plot of 1694. Now, um, they, they'd been accused of plotting the death of William. Uh, they all denied it. The case against them collapsed. Uh, they all said uh, they weren't guilty. And then about 50 years later, evidence was found in a, a, a wall of a house that showed that there had very much been a plot and they very much had been plotting the death of the king. So there was obviously this sort of underlying thing that was King, uh, king William going on. But with the appointment of, uh, of uh, of uh, the elector of Hanover, George, as king, you then had a series of anti-Hanoverian riots around the country, not necessarily in Lancashire, though there was one in, in Manchester. And this led to the passing of the first Riot Act. Whenever magistrates read the Riot Act, this is the Riot Act that they read. And new penal laws were introduced against Catholic. You couldn't own a horse worth more than a fiver. You couldn't own weapons. And then as the year wore on, in September 1715, a leading Jacobite, Lord Widrington, visited Richard Townley at Townley Hall, and Townley assured Widrington that if there was a rising, 20,000 Lancastrians would join, not just the Catholics, but also the High Church Anglicans um, from the east of the county. In November, there was an order issued for all Catholics to be arrested, but that didn't happen. And that was against the background then was that in September of 1715, the Earl of Mar had raised the banner of James III, declared him King of Scotland. Um, and a month later, James Radcliffe, Earl of Derwentwater, a Catholic and um, a, a descendant on the wrong side of the blanket of Charles II, he raised the, uh, the banner of James III and declared him King of England uh, in uh, in Northumberland. And he appointed this guy, uh, he, he was a the Tory MP for Northumberland, a cousin, to raise an army. Now this chap had no military experience at all. His sole advantage was that he wasn't a Catholic. And there was a fear that they didn't want it to look like this was just a Catholic rebellion. So he was, he was appointed to lead the army. And he, they, they raised an army at Rothbury, James raised his army at Braemar, and they moved together to join up at Kelso on the 22nd of October to have a, a powwow to decide where to go next. Um, and they decided to leave part of the army behind in Scotland, but the rest of them, whoops, oh dear, sorry about that. Can I just, um, just find out what happened there? Okay. Oh, sorry. I am. Um, I, I don't know quite why we've lost that, but we have. Let me just. Um... <clears throat> nope. I don't know why I'm not getting past that one, but uh, whoops. There we are. Okay. Sorry. Right. So. Um... Uh, the armies joined up, they then moved into England and they moved down through crossing the, 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 the boundary into England on the 31st of October and moving down through Cumbria. They, they, there was a little bit of an attempt to stop them at Penrith, but the, the militia ran away, there wasn't a shot fired. And then on the 9th of November, they reached Preston. Now, oh dear. Sorry, I do apologise, I don't know what's happening here. Um. <laughs> Might just be that slide, Bill. It, it seems to be that slide. I don't know why. Let me move past that and see if we can. Uh... Oops. 
I'm going. I'm going. I'm going to. Uh, right. Okay. And uh, this is this is what uh, Robert Patton, that clergyman, uh, says. Basically, the the army was moving south. Um, they the the way was rainy. The ways were deep. They left the foot soldiers behind in Garstang. The cavalry moved on into Preston, and and then on the morning of the 10th of November, the army, the foot soldiers having arrived in from Garstang, they marched up to the cross and then proclaimed the pretender, the claimant to the throne. Now that was the ceremony that we were reenacting in 2015. News of this. I said before about the newspapers, news of this then spreads rapidly. This is an account that was published in Liverpool in November the 11th, two days after, saying that the, the rebels have arrived. There's about 2,000 of them. Looks like they're going to make a stand. They've got six or eight pieces of cannon. And it says General Carpenter has come to Garstang and General Wills is at Wigan. Now, um, the, we know from uh, a variety of sources that people, local Catholics had, and gentry had started to move into Preston. Here are a number of the people who joined the rebels at Preston, Lord Molyneux of Bardsey, Mr. Walton of Windermere, Mr. Hodgson of Leighton, Mr. Carnes of Halton, etc., Mr. Dalton of Thurnham, moving south through the county. So these are people who'd signed up and joined the rebels at Preston. And here's a list of a lot of people who had signed up saying that they had military service. Jordan Langdale served two years under Colonel Sheldon. So we're now getting some local gentry, some of whom had military service, but what we're not getting is anything like the 20,000 high church Tories that Townley had promised would join the rebels. So we've got about 2000 or so rebels in Preston possibly as many as 500 locals, but nothing like the numbers that they'd hoped for. And meanwhile, the ladies in this town are so very beautiful and so richly attired that the gentlemen soldiers from Wednesday to Saturday minded nothing but court courting and feasting. So they, they, uh, they reached Preston, they found it was undefended, they couldn't believe their luck. And instead of uh, doing what any sensible general would do, but then um, they didn't have a sensible general, they relaxed. They, they spent their time courting and feasting and, and generally having fun. But meanwhile, General Wills was moving up from the south and General Carpenter, who'd been, uh, he'd been, he'd been wrong footed. He, he'd gone up to Newcastle thinking they were coming down the A1 when in fact they came down the A6 in effect. Um, so he had, when he realized that he was moving down, but he was a few days behind. Uh, the position. So now we've got Wills moving in, we've got Carpenter moving in from the other side, together outnumbering the rebels. And the big difference is they were professional soldiers. Um, there were obviously some professionals with the rebels, but by and large, they weren't professional soldiers. Now, let's move on to the battle itself. Um, and what we can see here is that the rebels upon reaching Preston, Preston basically had three roads, Church Street, Fishergate, Friargate, and they blocked each of these roads with barriers and had put their cannon, remember the account said they had between six and eight cannon, they put their cannon here expecting to be defending themselves. What they hadn't done amazingly, was to defend the bridge, which was the main way into the town. And when Wills arrived here, he couldn't believe his luck. He was able to pass over uh, the bridge and, and take his army into the town without a shot being fired. He left behind troops entrenched on either side. When they reached the entrance to the town, if you know Preston, this is where the prison is. At the, uh, so, he did a, a completely stupid thing, which was he ordered a frontal attack down this narrow road of Church Street against the barrier and against the, um, uh, the cannon. And that was what we were recreating with that shot. So you can see there the, 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 the first barrier and the second barrier with the cannon. On either side, there were tall buildings which were full of rebel snipers 
uh, shooting down onto the uh, the attacking Hanoverian troops, the government troops, and about 100, 120 of them were killed in that assault. Now, the rebels did fall back and the, the government then moved in and burnt the, the, the houses on either side so it couldn't happen again. But the initial loss had very much gone to the government side. At the other end of town, at the Friargate end, again, there was a, a, a barrier and cannon and the government um, Wills didn't order his troops to attack. He, he ordered them to set fire to the houses on the, the, the top end of that road to clear the way should an attack um, be, be ordered. These, um, incidentally, this, these dragoons, who are a sort of mounted infantry, this refers to dispositions after Carpenter had arrived. Because when Carpenter arrived, not only was he horrified at the loss of life that had happened on that first day, but he was also amazed that Wills had not blocked the western side of the town, leaving um, the means by which large numbers of rebels um, disappeared into the night. They came down uh, Fishergate here, they came down from Friargate, they forded the river in two places, and um, they were getting away. Now, it, it says here that Carpenter immediately ordered troops in place to stop up these uh, these escape holes. But you can see it on that original um, manuscript map better. The, the rebels were getting off down this way, fording there, and others were coming down here and fording there. And there was even a ferry there. I don't, I don't suppose many people actually crossed by the ferry. This uh, prospect of Preston from the, uh, the Buck brother, Stephen Buck, shows, I think, the, the, the helps you to understand the thing quite well. Here's the bridge that was undefended by the rebels. Um, Wills then went up to onto the, 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 the brow and attacked down towards the church, losing a large number of men at that time. Here's the other end of town where this, the, the windmill is there. And you can see the way it was wide open for rebels to flee once they realized that they were surrounded. So on the 13th of November, Foster and Don't Water and a Scots Brigadier unconditionally surrendered to General Wills. Um, they realized that the case was hopeless. They, they, once Carpenter had blockaded them in, there was no escape. They, they weren't going to get any further. And something in the region of 1,500 people were, taking, were taken prisoner. And the uh, general allowed the army briefly to plunder the town carrying away money, plate, goods, chattels of most of the inhabitants. He, he, he thought he was being quite um, generous by only allowing them to do that for the one day. And here's a, a nice picture of the Jacobite troops laying down their arms. They were then, a lot of them were held in, in, in Preston Church, Parish Church. The gentlemen, the, the nobility, they were sent off to London. Uh, others were taken to Liverpool, to Wigan, to Chester and to other places, leaving the uh, government uh, in something of a quandary as to what to do with them. But it is, it is noticeable that although two clergymen were taken, one of whom was Mr. Patton, there was just the one popish priest in P Preston. And it says, having a great deal of the Jesuit, he contrived a most excellent disguise for he put on a blue apron, went behind an apothecary's counter and passed as an assistant or journeyman to the apothecary and so took an opportunity of getting off. He took care of his tabernacle, but left his wafer gods to be ridiculed by the soldiers. So um, there's the only priest who was actually in there during the, 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 the three day siege and he managed to escape, he wasn't captured. Now, one of the things I was looking at was where, where are the bodies? You, you know, you've got <coughs> perhaps 120 government troops killed in that first assault. You've got more killed at the other end of the town. The, uh, so perhaps 200 government troops in all, no more than 20 Jacobites were killed because they were all safely behind barri barricades. But even so, we're talking far too many people to bury in the parish churchyard. But in, during the 19th century, as th this area of town started to be developed, more and more bones were found, um, a cartload of bones. I don't know how many bones there are to the cartload. More bones behind the Sun Hotel here, more behind the Woolpack Inn, ten, nine or 10 skeletons. So it looks like 
a, a fa you know, fairly decent war graves were laid out in this area behind here in the open field there. They weren't just dumped in pits, they were properly laid out. And some, at least one, had uh, a sword uh, buried with him. This is the remains of a sword dug up in 1867. And that is the only archeological remain that I know of, of the battle. Now on the same day as the surrender at Preston, the army, the Scots army that had remained behind in Scotland was defeated at Sheriff Moor. That's not strictly true to say, the battle at Sheriff Moor was inconclusive, but when you're doing a rebellion, if you don't win, you lose. And, and basically the army uh, dispersed, the rebellion collapsed. So I'm very conscious that I'm running out of time, so I'm going to press on. What then happened, and this is within a matter of weeks of the battle, they start taking witness statements. Uh, and these are some of these hundreds of thousands of documents that are in queue. And what they're trying to establish is of all the people they've captured, who are the guilty ones? Because of course, all of them said, oh, I just happened to be in the town. Uh, I, I wasn't taking any active part in it. So here, for example, it says, the said Richard Shuttleworth of Preston, gentleman with a sword. You know, I saw him with a sword. So he can't deny he's Catholic, he was armed, there's no question that he was a baddie. And this, this Shuttleworth of Preston here, these are all the people, all the papers in this, this bundle that refer to people saying that they'd seen him taking an active part. Now, if you look at this particular list, you'll see that there are a number of names that have got asterisks alongside them, and it says those are the ones who are in custody. The rest of these are names of people who are known to be active, but who have escaped far more than are in custody. And against many of these names is the letter P. The P are papists. So they've recorded who was there, what action they took, whether they were Catholics or not, and whether they're in custody. And then they moved on to the next stage, which was in Liverpool, where they started trying the first batch, and that was in January, so two months after the, the event. And here you can see Richard Shuttleworth, Roger Moncaster, Thomas Cope, William Butler, William Arkwright. And on the 28th of January, that group of men were hanged, drawn and quartered on Gallows Hill in Preston. Now there had been some previous executions, some army officers who had deserted their regiments and joined the other side. They were summarily executed and shot in Preston in December. Fortnight later, 10 days later, there was another batch of prisoners um, executed, again, hanged, drawn and quartered on Gallows Hill in Preston. So they were starting to, to take the action, the only action possible for treason, which is execution by hanging, drawing and quartering. If you are um, not a noble, if you are a noble, then beheading. And uh, Lord Derwentwater was beheaded. He looks remarkably relaxed for somebody who's just had his head chopped off, but anyway. Just a, a little point about Gallows Hill. If you, go, if you know Preston, if you drive out of Preston heading towards Lancaster, you come up this road, which is now built up um, it, higher than it, it was then, it, because they uh, ease the, the um, uh, you know, the relief. But this was Gallows Hill on this side of Preston, uh, 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 on this side of the Lancaster Road. And it was developed in the mid 19th century. And the Church of St. Thomas of Canterbury and English Martyrs was built on that site there, English Martyrs Place. But there's an amazing thing. If you look at the roads, the street names in the vicinity, Shuttleworth, Arkwright, Moncaster, Butler, Lockhart, these are the guys who were executed on that spot. Derwentwater, Kenmuir, these are the, 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 the nobility who were executed down in London. And you've even got Lovett who was actually executed in the 1745. But again, quite clearly, whoever it was who developed this, uh, the, these roads, these houses, was very much a Jacobite sympathizer. He even names this road, St. James's Road, which almost certainly is a, another nod in the direction of the Jacobite cause. We then have a lull until September. There's another batch of trials, and those I've marked with a star were hanged, uh, but not drawn and quartered um, in, uh, in, in Preston. And overall, this is just to highlight what the problem was. We've had 1,500 prisoners taken, 
the important ones were sent down to London. They initially drew lots and one in 20 were tried. And we, we reckon about 39 men were executed in Lancashire and others in London, about 50 executions in all. But what on earth were they going to do with the other 1,500? Now, some were found not guilty, some escaped, some died in prison, but you really had a major problem. What are you going to do with those other prisoners? Are we really going to take them out in batches of half a dozen for the next 10 years, executing them uh, on the Gallows Hill? So what they did instead was offer the prisoners a choice. They could volunteer for transportation or they could run the risk of being tried. Now, I say volunteer for transportation because legally there was only one thing you could do. If you were found guilty of to be executed by hanging, drawing and quartering, there, there was no alternative sentence. So, but if you volunteered for transportation, you would get away with your life. <coughs> so the deal was accept transportation as a slave and indentured laborer for seven years. At the end of that period, you would get a pardon conditional upon never returning home. And some 600 men took up that offer, mainly Scots and Northumbrians, and 10 ships sailed during that summer of 1716 for Jamaica and Virginia, Maryland, and so on. When we did that reenactment and uh, commemoration in November 2015, I met a couple of Scot uh, families of uh, people from Carolina who were descendants of some of those Scots who, would, uh, who had found their way as indentured laborers um, and stayed behind to make their fortunes. There weren't many Lancastrians transported. I've named a couple there. But the government then still had the problem. We still had getting on for 800 or so prisoners. And so they decided in 1717 to pass an act of grace. All the prisoners were released. All the outlaws were allowed to return home, but not the transported prisoners. <clears throat> and the government set about deciding how to stop this from ever happening again. And they, they set about confiscating the property and undermining the finances of the Catholic gentry of Lancashire and elsewhere through that forfeited estates commission. And again, enormous documentation. This is Fullwood where I live. All of these, and it goes on for pages, are the Catholics. They're just ordinary people, a yeoman, a widow, a husbandman, a labourer, a husbandman, a labourer, a husbandman, etc. Just ordinary people. And it's a, very much a matter of we know who you are and we know where you live. It was very much a threat. The constables were sent to each parish, each township to record um, whether anybody in that area had been attainted. So thus in Billsborough, Mr. Shuttleworth uh, was executed at Preston. His estate was formally mortgaged. Mr. Wadsworth was executed. We have no reputed popish priests here and we, we have no land given to superstitious uses. This land for superstitious purposes was land that was set aside to support priests or, or, or whatever. <coughs> and again, all the details of how much these people were worth. There's Richard Shuttleworth, we've come across him. He was worth 60 pounds a year. But at the other end of the scale, here's Squire Anderton of Lostock. He was worth 2,500 a year. But the majority of the troops like these guys here have nil value, they don't own any property. When Daniel Defoe came by 12 years later, he, 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 he was very impressed by Preston. But he goes on to say that about the battle, the late bloody action, not that the battle hurt many of the immediate inhabitants, but so many families there and thereabouts have been touched by the consequences of it that it will not be removed in a few years. And they seem to have a kind of remembrance of things upon them still. Well, I mean, you can well imagine the sort of you know, post-traumatic shock, et cetera, of having a battle and then going through this whole bureaucratic process of having your, your finances inquired, having your name written down on a list to make sure it didn't happen again. And in 1745, when Prince, Bonnie Prince Charlie came through, no locals went to join the, the cause at all. It had worked. And my final slide here is just, somebody sent me this after I did a talk. Uh, they'd photographed this in the Vatican, which I thought was rather interesting. And it says, um, James III, that's him, the, the son of James, James II, King of Great Britain, his son 
Charles Edward, that's Bonnie Prince Charlie, and Henry, the Cardinal Henry. So there's James the, uh, the, the third. Here's his two sons, Bonnie Prince Charlie and the Cardinal Henry. He, he remained the last claimant to the Stuart throne. And it says here, the last Postramus, the last of the, the, um, uh, the, the um, I'm trying to think of the right word. Anyway, the, the last of the Stuart line, and that's early in the 19th century. By then, everybody accepted the cause was dead, and even the Pope and the King of France had recognized the, the Hanoverians as true kings. Thank you. I'm going to uh, leave it there and end my screen share if I can. Well, thank you very much indeed, Bill. That was, okay. uh, good. Yes, we, we've, we've got everyone back. Good, good. Um, <laughs> uh, absolutely. Yes. I, just please do fire off questions via the chat. I'll have to keep everyone muted, but let's just mm -hmm. start with a mute round of applause for Bill. <laughs> <laughs>